Welcome investigators to the Arkham Horror the Card Game tutorial. Arkham Horror is a cooperative game for one to four players, where players will take on the role of investigators and go through scenario based campaigns. You can play this game in one of two ways. You can play it as a campaign where investigators start at level zero and accumulate experience over the course of scenarios in a specific order, or you can play it as standalone scenarios you simply pick one, set up a deck for that scenario, and begin play. I'm going to show you how to play the game using campaign rules and with two players. So the first thing you're going to want to do is select an investigator. The core box here comes with five, but as the game grows and gets more expansions and packs, there will be more investigators, so more options to choose from. I'll pick these two right here. You're going to also want to nominate one to be the lead investigator. It's more of a symbolic role. The lead investigator would only be needed when specific cards say so, or to break ties and to make decisions when there are multiple options available. So when you pick an investigator, you're going to want to look at the back of their card, and you're going to need to construct their deck. Now here in the back, it says what class cards are available to this investigator. There are five classes of cards, Guardians, Seekers, Rogues, Mystics, and Survivors. Then there's also a common pile everyone else can draw from and construct their deck with. Now when you're starting a campaign, you are limited to level zero cards. What does that mean? A card is level zero if it has no pips in the upper left corner here. If a card has a pip, it is a level card based on the number of pips it has. So this card is level 1, this is level 2, etc, etc. So when you're constructing a brand new deck, you can only bring in level 0 cards. So it says what classes I can pick from, Seeker cards, level 0 through 5, Mystic cards, level 0 through 2, and Neutral cards, level 0 through 5. Once I've gathered 30 of those cards, it also says that I need to add specific cards that would not go towards the deck size. So the standard 30 cards that I just grabbed all together here and then adding these three new cards would make my deck of 33. So let me talk a little bit about madness cards. It wouldn't be Arkham Horror unless everything was against you, even your own deck. Your deck at the very beginning will start off with at least two madness cards, one unique to your character and then one you'll draw at random from the common pile. Whenever you draw these cards during your gameplay, you must immediately resolve them, whether it's on your turn or during an enemy turn or whatever. These cards are usually bad and can really change the turn of events that you had planned in ahead. And it's even possible during your campaign to get more madness cards into your deck. It only goes to show you that you can't trust everything, even yourself. Once both players have created their decks, they're ready to start. But before we do that, we're going to need to determine the difficulty of the game we're going to play. To do that, we're going to need to grab all the chaos tokens. These tokens will determine the difficulty of the game. In the book, there are guidelines for which tokens to grab if you want to do an easy, standard, hard, or insane difficulty game. I'll be setting this up for a standard difficulty by simply grabbing the specific number that I need. I'll put them into a bag or whatever equivalent you would like to use so that you can't see what they are because these tokens are double sided and that's how you set your difficulty. So let's take a look at the scenarios. If we're doing a campaign, each campaign will come with its own booklet here talking about the lore and all the story reasons why you're here, but also giving you all the setup rules. As you can see here, it talks about setting the difficulty based on the tokens. And on the next page, you'll find all the information you need for setting up the actual scenario. Now, this here has a lot of spoilers in it in terms of story, so I won't be reading any of that to you. You can experience the story for yourself for the first time when you get the copy of your own game. So each scenario comes with a specific set of cards. Here we have the gathering. 
This icon with the torch will show that any cards matching this symbol will belong to the gathering scenario. So set this off to the side, we're going to need it during the setup. The next thing we're going to need to do is to make the encounter deck. This will be the deck of monsters and obstacles that we'll be facing during the game. The encounter deck is made up of sets of different encounter cards, each with their own theme and challenges. In the campaign guide, it'll tell you which sets to grab from matching these symbols. Once you've gathered up all the cards, the rest of the encounter sets will not be needed and can be put back into the box. In the setup for the gathering, it says to put the study into play. Whenever you put a location into play, it'll begin on its locked side. Here at the top, you see that this location is locked and it doesn't have a lot of information other than flavor text. This setup specifically says to also set aside two cards that they call out in particular. So we'll simply set these off to the side. It then says to shuffle the remainder of the encounter cards, which I will simply do here. And then we're able to set up the rest of the cards here. Now it didn't say to put any of the locations into play, so I'll put those aside as well. There are two sets of cards that are very important in a scenario, which is the Act and the Agenda deck. The Act deck is what the investigators will need to accomplish in order to gain a more favorable result in the scenario. The agenda deck is the monster's plans to foil the investigators and to make things hard. When playing the game, both of these decks are going to advance, but it's up to the investigators to make sure they advance the agenda deck as fast as they can. The number numerically, starting with one, make sure that's at the top, and the rest follow sequentially under it. You'll place that in a central position near the top of the board with the agenda deck next to it. Set the encounters off to the side. And then lastly, you have this reference card. This reference card is double-sided and will allow you to select an easy or hard mode for this scenario. We're going to set it to easy slash standard and just put it there. Now this scenario says each investigator begins play at the study. You will take the mini cards representing your investigators and place them at the location specified. Whenever you begin play or whenever you move into a new location, you will then flip it to reveal the information on it. So here we have the location. This number here is what we need to pay attention to when a location is revealed. This shows how many clues will be spawned per investigator. Two shows how many clues and that symbol means per investigator. So since we have two players here, we'll be needing to grab four clue tokens in total, two per investigator. The clue tokens are double-sided. On the other side is the doom tokens, which the enemies will be using to advance their deck. Each investigator will prepare their decks by shuffling them up and drawing five cards, and they will also gather five resources which are represented by these box tokens. These are the tokens that will allow the players to call upon their cards and to actually use them. Once both players have drawn their hands and gathered their resources, you're ready to play the scenario. There's a double-sided reference card here that will show you the brown sequence and the actions an investigator can perform on their turn. So at the very beginning of a round, you'll perform the mythos phase. However, if this is the very first round of the scenario, you'll skip the Mythos phase, taking you to the Investigators phase. When it's the Investigators phase, you will choose as a team who wants to go first. That's why I said it didn't really matter who was the lead investigator because you'll end up picking who wants to go first anyways. There's no specific turn order, so you're going to have to work together to determine who's best to go. When it's your turn, as an investigator, you'll perform three actions that are on this card. And I'll explain each of them in order. First, you may draw a card. Self-explanatory. Simply take a card from the top of your deck and draw it. Put it into your hand. Secondly, you may gain a resource. Simply take a resource from the pool and add it to your personal supply. You may play a card from your hand. Now there are three types of cards in this game. 
you have event cards you'll simply pay their cost use the card and then discard it assets cards you will pay the cost at the top from your resource pool and when you play an asset this will be sort of equipped to your character now there are limitations on how many cards you can have equipped usually one for every slot and two singular hands but in this example here talents you can have an unlimited supply of they don't take up any sort of a slot and lastly the kind of card you have here is a skill card these can't be played these can only be used in conjunction with a skill check which i'll be describing later so that's how you play a card the next thing you can do is to activate a card action card actions can be found on cards these arrows represent actions that the player can take so they will simply declare which action they would like to perform spend their action point to then perform that specific action. The next thing you can do is move to a different location. Now right now we can't do that because there are no locations that we can move to. But let's fast forward here and let me show you how that works. So for example here, we'll later find ourselves in the hallway. And there will be other locations for us to explore. Now this hallway is connected to these rooms as indicated by these colored dots. It's connected to the blue triangle, the brown cross, and the green rhombus. So as a move action, we can go from one location to any of the connected locations on the bottom of the card. So I can choose which location I want to go to. And when you go to a new location for the first time, you will flip it and then add clue tokens based on the number of investigators. Now again, I won't spoil any of this for you, so you can experience it for yourself. The next thing you can do is investigate a location, and this is where we're gonna be talking about skill checks. So to investigate, you perform a skill check, and if you succeed, you'll be able to take one of the clue tokens at your location and place it onto your card. So how do you perform a skill check? Specifically, the investigation skill check will be based off of a player's lore. There are four stats here on the top of your card. Willpower, lore, strength, and agility. Daisy's lore here is five, and the difficulty of this check will be based off the shroud value of your location, which is the left number here on the location card. So the difficulty of this location is two. We're trying to beat two, and right now, we currently do that with five but that check will be augmented with our little bag here of chaos tokens which could reduce our skill in that check so the way we counterbalance that for example here my lore here is five and i want to boost it so i'm going to discard this card as part of my skill check and it has one lore icon on it so that would make my skill now six now you the one that's going to perform the skill can spend as many cards as you would like to try and boost your skill value. But your teammates can also help you out. They can also discard a card in the same manner that you do to boost your check. However, in order to do this, they must be at your location and they can only discard one card each. After everyone has finished discarding their cards for the skill check, you will then take your bag or whatever equivalent you have Jumble up all the chaos tokens and pick one at random. So here I got a minus three. So my five would have been subtracted by three. You will succeed at a check if you are equal to or greater than the difficulty of the check. So my five getting reduced by three becomes two, which is equal to two. So I succeed. I will simply take the token, put it on my card. Congrats. If you fail, you simply will not take the clue token and you've effectively wasted your turn and any cards you attempted to boost your value with. So that's how you perform a skill check. Now in this bag, I talked about chaos tokens. You got all sorts of different chaos values here from negative numbers to zero to a few special symbols here. There are three special symbols here. 
that are on the reference card. Whenever you draw those symbols, simply refer to this to show what those values are actually equal to. But these two symbols are not on that reference card. If you draw the blue elder sign, this actually refers to an ability on your player character. You refer to your character and look at the elder sign effect and perform it like that. But if you happen to draw this red tentacle, your check automatically fails because this means you've failed. But there are some cards that make reference to if you failed by X amount, then act as if you got a zero. Every time you draw a token, you'll simply put it back in the bag so that this bag is always filled. During the game, you'll be drawing from this deck and encountering monsters and challenges. Now, monsters can be engaged with you, engaged with a teammate, at the location you're at, or at a different location. But you can fight with a monster in any of those locations. If it was engaged with you, with a teammate, with a location. You simply can't fight a monster at a different location, however. How do you fight monsters? Monsters here have a few values on their card. The top left is their combat value. When you fight a monster, you're trying to beat this value. If you succeed, you'll deal one damage. The middle number here is their health. The top right value here is the evade value. If you can beat that value, you can evade a monster, but I'll explain that later. So what are some specific rules in regards to fighting monsters? So if a monster is engaged with my teammate here, and I want to fight it, that's great. I will simply do the check, and if I succeed, I deal damage. But if I fail at attacking a monster, engage with the teammate, I will not damage the monster. Instead, I will damage my own teammate. So to prevent that, you can engage with a monster. You spend an action, take a monster from anywhere at your location or engage with a teammate at your location and instead put it in your what's called a threat area and now you are engaged with the monster and can attack it freely by spending an action. So those are the rules for fighting and engaging. Now there's one more thing I need to explain if you are engaged with an enemy here and you perform any action other than to fight it, to evade it, or to activate specific parlay or resign abilities that might show themselves on the card or on other cards in the game, that monster will perform an attack of opportunity. You've effectively tried to ignore the monster, but it's going to take a cheap shot at you for trying to ignore it. To do that, it'll simply get a free attack on you. Monsters here will have health and horror values showing how much damage it does, and you will simply take that much for free. So you don't want to ignore enemies. These attack of opportunities happen before you even perform the action you're trying to ignore them with. So let's say for example, whatever the situation was, this player felt that if we could just get that last investigation token, we're going to win the game. So I don't care that I'm engaged with this monster, I want to investigate. Well, first, the monster would attack you, and after, if you survive, then you can perform your investigation action. So it's very important to keep into consideration when dealing with monsters in your threat area. Again, this attack of opportunity only happens if the monster is in your threat area. If you've already evaded it and it's in the location and nobody's engaged with it, then you can do whatever you want. But if it's engaged with you, but if you try to move to a different location, it's going to still follow you because it's in your threat area. Now I mentioned you can also evade an enemy. You will simply perform a skill check trying to beat the monster's agility value and if you succeed you've successfully evaded the enemy. You would then exhaust the enemy by turning it onto its side and placing it at the location out of your threat area. This can be very good because exhausted monsters will not act during the monster phase. So you've effectively stunned them for a single turn. So there are a few other actions you can perform that aren't really considered actions. There are free and reactionary actions you can perform. A free action is something signified with this lightning bolt. These don't cost an action to perform, 
and you can simply do what it tells you you need to do and perform its quote unquote action. And then there are reactionary actions. A reactionary action has this roundabout arrow. These actions are performed in reaction to something, in a reaction to specific requirements. And once they are fulfilled, you may perform the action. So here it says after you evade an enemy, exhaust this card so that you can then draw a card. Another thing you can do during your turn, which doesn't require an action, is to take clue tokens and to place them onto the act deck. This can be done on any investigator's turn as a group. You will collectively spend your clue tokens and place them onto, place them onto the act card. Once the act card has a number of investigation tokens equal to, it says here it needs two per investigator, so that means we need all four. Once its requirements have been fulfilled, you will simply discard all the tokens and then flip over the card and resolve any of its effects. Once you finish resolving its effects, you will discard it and look at the next act card. This is effectively how you win the game. That's the investigator's phase. Once every investigator has had their turn to perform their three actions, it moves on to the enemy's phase. The first thing that happens is that enemies with the hunter keyword will move toward the nearest investigator. So let's go back to our example here with multiple locations. And let's say we've already run away from the swarm of rats last turn. And so now we have a swarm of rats here that is ready. It's not exhausted. It is ready and it has the hunter ability. So during the enemy phase, it'll move towards the nearest investigator. Because it's at the attic, its location it's connected to is the hallway, and it'll go whoop, and it'll just run right in there. And now we'll talk about how do enemies act when they need to engage an investigator. So if an enemy at any point is ready and at a location with an investigator, it will immediately try to engage an investigator. And during the enemy phase, each engaged enemy will attack by, again, looking at the card, seeing what damage it does, and adding that onto the investigator. Now, investigators can acquire cards that have health and horror values on them. For example here, I could have this ally played on my side of the field, and they have a health and sanity value. So when I take that damage, instead of putting it onto myself, I could put it onto my ally, effectively mitigating some damage off me if I really needed it. But if one of your allies or whatever cards that have these tokens on them, if they ever, of course, reach their maximum threshold, then they will be discarded and are effectively destroyed. Once each enemy has moved if they're a hunter, engaged and attacked, then we'll go to the upkeep phase. During the investigator phase, after each player has finished their turn, they will flip over their cards to show that they're done. So by the end of the turn, every investigator will be this grayed out portrait. During the upkeep phase, we will refresh any cards that were exhausted and reflip over our mini tokens to know that we're ready for a new round. This also counts towards enemies. So if Daisy here had evaded this swarm of rats and it was exhausted, that means it couldn't do anything during the enemy phase because it was exhausted. It was effectively stunned. But during this upkeep phase, it would ready up. And what did I say? Whenever a monster is ready at a location with investigators, it will immediately engage one investigator. So the investigators will have to pick who does it engage? If enemies have the prey keyword, it'll tell you when you have this conflict who it will specifically go after. But again, if there's also multiple options that have that requirement, then you as a team would pick who does it affect. After all cards have been unexhausted, each player will then draw a card and take a resource token from the pool and put it into their stash. And then each investigator would check how many cards do they have in their hand. 
If they have more than eight cards, they will discard down to eight. And that's a round. And we'd go right back to the beginning. But this time, because it would be the second round, we would perform the Mythos phase. So at the beginning of the Mythos phase, we'll take a Doom token and place it onto the agenda. And then we'll check how many Doom tokens exist on the board at all. There are some card effects that might place Doom tokens on other cards in the game. And then if during this step, when you're checking for Doom tokens, it is equal to or greater than the number here on the agenda deck, you will discard all Doom tokens and then flip this card, performing any specific details that are on the back of that card. And then once an agenda has been fulfilled, you'll maybe put it aside to reveal the agenda below it. After doing all that with the agenda deck, then each player, starting with the lead investigator, will draw a card from the encounter deck. So Skids here will take the first card and perform whatever needs to be performed on the card. There are two types of encounters. You have treacheries and enemies. Treacheries are sort of challenges that the investigators will have to defeat and enemies are enemies. Monsters that will stick around and be a real pain. After drawing the card, do whatever it says that you need to do, place it in front of you, perform any checks if necessary or keep it in your play area, whatever it says. But once a treachery or enemy has been defeated, you will then discard it into its encounter discard pile. And then the next investigator would then draw their card, perform any actions, etc, etc. After all players have done this, then it's back to the investigator's phase. Something else to point out, it's possible to draw enemy cards that say spawn. So normally when you draw the encounter, you would place it in front of you because you're dealing with it. This is, it would, if it's a monster, it'd be placed in your threat area. But if it says spawn on it, you will instead not place it in your threat area and place it in the location it tells you to spawn it. And then if there was an investigator at the location, it would engage them instead. And that's how you play Arkham Horror the card game. The goal of the game is to reach some sort of resolution. Usually towards the bottom of the act deck, there will be an R with a number next to it, which will tell you which resolution to read from the campaign book. Now it's also possible to resign. In order to do that, there will usually be a card somewhere on the board that says, as an action, resign, quit, just leave and be effectively removed from the game. If at any time you are defeated, you will discard all your cards, discard all your tokens, and place them at your location. But let me tell you, resigning is better than being killed or driven insane. If you take a number of wounds equal to your health, you will of course be killed, and also suffer the same effects as resigning, except now you'll get even more penalties towards future games, which I'll explain in a bit. Same thing happens if you take a number of sanity tokens equal to your threshold, etc, etc. So why is quitting better than being killed? If you were killed or driven insane, you will suffer a penalty. And that penalty is you will suffer a physical or mental trauma. It's not so bad as it kind of makes it sound, but what it means is you will suffer a sort of permanent health damage or sanity damage in each subsequent scenario in the campaign. So after resolving all of this, and let's say Daisy here was killed in the previous game, but Skids managed to just resign and escape, he didn't suffer a trauma, but I did. And that means at the start of every game, I'll begin with one less wound because I have a physical trauma or a mental trauma. I'll be dealt a single point of mental damage at the very beginning of the game. That's pretty bad, especially if you start racking up so many traumas that by the start of the game, you are immediately defeated. That means your investigator is effectively killed and may no longer participate in the campaign. If something so bad were to happen to you, and yet you still had a certain number of missions left in the campaign, you would have to remake a new character. 
to continue through the campaign, but such is the nature of Arkham Horror Games. Once a scenario is finished, once you've reached a resolution by finding it on a card that tells you to look at a specific resolution, or if every player has been defeated or resigned, you will look at the campaign log here. Again, I'm not going to spoil it for you. But it effectively has an entry for each of the resolutions. The first one usually being if no resolution was reached because every player resigned or was defeated. It will tell you to read off something lore wise and then it will tell you what to do in the campaign log by marking players health etc or whatever and experience points. Players can earn bonus experience points throughout the game any number of ways. They can defeat specific monsters that have victory in their description. If this monster was defeated, you would put it into what's known as a victory display, you know, kind of off to the side, so that once the game is over, you'll grab all the cards that had that victory display and count them up, and you would gain all those victory points as experience points, which is great. You can also find them on locations. Again, I don't want to spoil it too much for you, but that's effectively what it would look like. If you manage to investigate a location completely so that there are no more clue tokens on it, at the end of the game, you can claim that location as a victory card and also be able to gain its victory points as experience. So how do you spend experience points? You can spend them by purchasing card upgrades. Again, we'll refer back to your card here and show what limitations you have. So Daisy can get level 0 through 5 secret cards and level 0 through 2 mystic cards. So we'll look at the cards and show which cards you can purchase. So Daisy could purchase these, but she couldn't purchase these. We'll look at all of her options from your collection and you can spend experience points to purchase them. One experience point per level. So if I wanted to buy this magnifying glass, it's level one card, it costs one experience point. So buy it, great. Now your deck must maintain the number of cards said here by the deck size. The cards that don't go towards the deck limit don't count and may never be removed from your deck. So if I were to purchase this magnifying glass, I'd have to find a card in here to replace it. You can only have two copies of a single name card in your deck, so keep that in mind. But it's also possible to upgrade cards. So if in my deck here I had, let's see, oh look, magnifying glass. These cards are the same, but one's level one and one's level zero. The level one card might have better bonuses and a lower cost, meaning it's a better card. You might even have more tokens here. So instead of purchasing it and simply replacing a different card in my deck, I can upgrade my magnifying glass here and replace it like that. It's effectively the same thing. You're still buying a card and replacing a card, but when doing something like this, you instead pay the difference between the two. So for example, if my magnifying glass here was, let's just say, level 2, and this magnifying glass was level 4, instead of paying 4 entire experience points to get this card, I would only pay 2, the difference between the two, and instead upgrade my old card. That's how you spend experience points to customize your deck. Any points that you do not spend will be tracked in the campaign log, and then you'll move on to the next scenario. Even if both players were to die, in a scenario, it's not over until you get to that final scenario in your campaign. You just wouldn't be in a good position. But it's not about winning or losing, it's about the story. Your story. The story of you, your deck of cards, and the friends that you play with. Even if you win or lose a scenario, it's totally okay because your experience is unique to you and your team. So experiment with new investigators, try out new decks, and delve into the Arkham Horror. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. If you have any questions, always feel free to leave a comment below or email me at cynicallyawesomegames at gmail.com. And that's all for now. Let's keep on rolling.